Welcome to episode number eight. In episode number seven, we spend some time taking a look at the Web Scarab tool and how we could use the fuzzing capability to automate some of the testing we'd like to do in web applications, particularly where it comes to input validation. In that episode, we took a look at the results of that and pointed out that as a first pass, we could look for the 500 internal server errors as an indication that serious things had gone wrong. However, it is equally possible that we have problems in the web application that are not generating 500 internal server errors. And in that episode, we promised that we would discuss in a future episode how we could begin to find those issues. So that episode has arrived, and we'll take a look at that here in episode 8. Now, I've already got a uh, development site loaded up there in my Firefox browser, and I've started up WebScarab now so that we can begin to take a look at it. This uh, development uh, web application we're taking a look at was written for one of our customers, and whenever we do the initial testing for an application like this, especially fuzzing validation, we feel it's extremely important to do that validation and testing in a test environment. You'll see why that's so important as we move through this uh, demonstration. And it's bigger than simply being in a position to create harm to a production application. While that's a big deal, there are other reasons why this kind of testing should probably be done here in the, develop in the, yeah, the development environment. Well, I've got it up and running, and I can see that I'm successfully talking to WebScarab, so we're ready to try this out. I'm going to use one of the simple forms here. There are a pile of different forms available that we could use to do the testing, but I'm simply going to use the note uh, or news f facility, which allows you to create simple news items and do our testing here. Because it's a simple form, there's only two fields, and the real focus of our episode here is less in how to do the fuzzing, episode 7, and more in how to process those results. So we'll just create a test article, and we'll save that. And we've successfully created an article. We can go back to news, and there it is. Well, if I go back into WebScarab now, I can see here that we have the post that was used to create that article. And if I right-click on that, we can send it over to the fuzzing template, just as we did in Episode 7. Now, some of this episode is going to go pretty fast, because it's actually recapping some of the things from Episode 7. But when we get to using the search function, that's where it gets really interesting. So as we did in episode 7, we pulled the form here into the fuzzer, and we set up a fuzzing source that we can use to do our automated testing. And I'll use the same file that I used there, this all attack file that I maintain. This file, as we mentioned in the last episode, is just going to contain a variety of things that we found over the years that will cause problems in some web applications. Maybe injecting script tags, maybe putting in nulls, Maybe we have some command injection or even SQL injection. We'll close that up. And now, as we did in the last episode, we'll set that up to be used in some of the fields. And I'm going to put it into the two input fields that we had in the application. Of course, eventually we'd want to test out the create field as well. But the authenticity token and the session ID, right now, we're going to leave these alone because we want to be able to successfully submit this element. Now, as we said in the last episode, too, we can change the sequence here by changing the priority. And we can see that now 134,000 queries will be required for this test. So we'll start that up. And off it goes. Now, I'm actually not going to let this run for long. Just 120 or so queries are fine. In the end, I would really let this run for all 134,000. But there's another step that I need to take. So far, we can see the result code coming back. And as in the last episode, we can see that this result code can tell us whether or not we have a problem. In the last episode, we were seeing 500 internal server error because it wasn't a well-formed application and we had it just in a development environment. But this one here in the QA environment, this one now has a different message, 302, not, uh, 302 found. This message, if we double click on it, it turns out as simply a redirect message back into another piece of the application. For this application, this is the correct response. Once we've created the result, it's going to redirect you so you can view what was actually submitted. Now, each application will be unique. It would be typical to find something like a 302 or a 200, but if we were finding a 401 or a 402 or a 404 or a 500, that would be an indication of a potential problem. 
So this query itself and its result is not terribly important. I want to know how I can process the 144,000 possible queries. Well, to do that, we'll go over to the search function. The search function over the years has evolved in the Web Scarab tool. Originally, this same interface would be available, but there would be no sample or starter queries available. As you can see, we have some queries here that will allow you to easily find things within the body of a response, the request, per, in, uh, request parameters, the request itself, or only in the response. And if I click on one of these, for instance in the request parameter search, it populates this field here to show me what that request will look like. If I change it to request search, it changes it again. Now, we're actually going to use the body search, and I want to explain a little bit what you're looking at here. Looking at this field, you may say, wow, that looks like a very complicated search. And in fact, it is. But the reason it looks so complex is one of the strengths that we have in WebScarab. Remember we said that the WebScarab tool, while being written in Java, also exposes part of its own API through the interface, allowing you to write Java beans right within the application using the bean shell. This is actually a small example of that. While this here is not strictly designed for us to write scripts in, we certainly could, though the search itself is written as a simple one-line script. In this case, we're looking at actual Java here to build a string and do a comparison or see if it contains a certain search term. Well, rather than having to learn Java, though, we can simply leverage what's already here, and that's one of the nice things about this newer version of WebScarab we have. So I can simply put search terms right in there and define the things I'd like to find. For example, if I'm using an Oracle server behind my application, I think I'd want to search for things like AuraDB, which will commonly appear in Oracle error messages. So let me put Oracle errors here, and I'll add that in as a search. So it's now highlighted Oracle errors, and you may have noticed that these buttons here grayed out for a few seconds because it was actually searching through all of the previous queries to see whether or not that appears. But there's other things that could be interesting. Maybe I want to find things like, how about SQL? Now if the letters SQL appear, that could be interesting for my application. Now, of course, if your application is going to display the word SQL somewhere, that wouldn't be a valid thing to search for. But if it's never supposed to use that, if it's not a common term, now if that shows up, it's a big deal. Let's add in a couple more. I might also add in something to identify, perhaps, uh, comments that appear within the HTML code. Now, comments in HTML are actually supposed to be less than exclamation dash dash, but I've found that not all web frameworks, and certainly not all web developers, follow standards. Yet the web browsers will perfectly happily accept simply exclamation dash. So let me take off the second dash because sometimes we'll find that there are inappropriate HTML comments where only the single dash has been used. And I'd really like to find all hidden content. So I'll add that in as another thing to search for, HTML comments, add it in. And again, it would repopulate. Now, just one or two other things. Let's add in something maybe to look for... How about JavaScript comments? Why am I looking for comments, you may wonder. Well, what I've found is that in the programming world, programmers tend to put in the least appropriate comments, and they put them in the worst possible places. So by looking for JavaScript comments and HTML comments, you will sometimes find examples where the programmer will tell you, oh, there's a piece of the application not working right now. We haven't yet fi fixed it. So be aware that this needs to happen soon. They, of course, didn't put that there for the attacker or the user. They put that there for themselves so that they would know in the future, I need to go back and fix that problem. Now, in this particular case, none of the searches that I've entered have created any results. And we can pick each one here simply by using the dropdown. And if any of those had occurred, they would immediately show up here. Just to show what would happen, why don't we go back over to Firefox and let's go to a page that might have some comments on it. So how about we go to sans.org? And let's just see what comes up. So we browse over to the sans site, and you may see in the background that there's already things happening. We're currently highlighting our JavaScript comments search. And if I now search or double click on this, 
I can pull it up and see what actually came through. And in this case here, it's telling me that it found a JavaScript comment, but more than likely, in this case since it's an image, it just happens to be that there's a forward slash and an asterisk that appears in the image. But if we look at some of the others, for instance, let's try this one here, and we take a look, oh, right away, we find a comment here, Expandable List Implementation by David Lindquist. So we have some information that we can see where this information was taken from that's now being used on the SAN site. Similarly, if we look at some of our other queries, how about HTML comments, we again find that there is, in fact, an HTML comment. Now, when I pull this up, I find that there's one right here, something for an urchin tracker, something that's being used for statistics. But rather than have to look through all of the possible searches or queries that were run, I can instead use my search facility to zero in on the things that are actually interesting to me. So using our fuzzer, we could now set it up to do the 43 million queries that we had last week, but if we intelligently configure some searches before we run the fuzzer, we'll very, very quickly be able to see our results after the fuzzer finishes running. Now, before I conclude the episode, there are just a few wrap-up issues. The first one is that when you're using that search facility, it is a really good idea to enter in your searches before you run the fuzzer. Otherwise, every single time you add a search, it needs to go through all of the queries that have previously been run to populate the results. So it can take you a long time to add in each query. However, if you add in those search queries before you run the fuzzer, it will work just fine and be a much more efficient use of your time. The other item is that I said that it's uh, not a good idea to do fuzzing testing within a production environment. So let me go back to our development site here. And I'll go right into the notices field. And you'll be able to see very, very quickly why it's not a great idea to run this in a production environment. Here we were doing our input validation testing, and we were creating several different notice items. And what you'll see here is that we have created notices for all kinds of things. So if we were to run this in production, well, that could create some issues. Now, of course, we do eventually need to know how the production environment responds, which is why we would want to do an accurate test in a quality assurance or dev environment that mirrors what's happening in production. And this does give us an opportunity, too, to see if there are any issues with cross-site scripting. I can say pretty safely that there's no issues in this particular case, because my cross-site scripting tests were also run in here, yet no additional windows were opened up as a result of this. So, we hope you enjoyed this particular episode. If you have questions or have any additional thoughts or comments, feel free to go over to the show notes posted on the SANS Audit blog. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, feel free to send me a note at dholzer at Enclave Forensics, or simply post a comment on the blog. Thanks for listening.